I remember being in Armenia back in 2008. I'd be on a road trip, and we'd pull into a little rest stop. There'd be these tables. They're still there, with women selling apples and dried fruit and gata. And there would also be these reused plastic bottles. But they wouldn't be filled with soda. They'd be filled with this sweet homemade wine. It wasn't the fanciest, but it definitely was fun. The wine wasn't what I was used to. If you've had wine from places like France or where I'm from, California, you've most likely had a dry wine. Those roadside wines are different. Because during the Soviet time, we used to produce like these sherry-style, port-style wines. They're used to that, the older generation. Mariam Sagatelian knows wine. She co-founded Invino, one of Armenia's most well-known wine bars. Sweet wines are made by fortifying the wine. So what they would do is they stop the fermentation using like sulfur or cooling down the wines. But Mariam only has dry wines at Invino. When they first started, customers weren't used to it. They came in and Mariam had to explain what she was even selling. But now customers feel right at home. A person just walks in literally, goes to the shelf, grabs the wine, comes to the register. They know where the wine is that they need. It's like a person feels like they're at home. So, like, I love that change of pace. As Armenian palates have changed, the Armenian wine industry has been reinvented. Today, it focuses on dry wines, and it is booming. In 2018, there were 25 wineries. In 2022, there were 150. There were six times more wineries than just four years before. Wine has changed, and Armenia has changed with it. And if you pay attention, you can taste where Armenia has come from and where it is headed. Welcome to Country of Dust, stories of a changing Armenia. This episode, these bottles have a story. I'm Jeremy Dalmas. Mariam doesn't just like wine, it is her life. So when someone says they don't drink wine, at first I'm like, okay, is it like an allergy or something? Because I don't want to believe that this person doesn't drink wine. So it's like, you don't drink wine? What do you drink? What do you do? Like, what's your poison of choice, you know? She's showing us around in Vino. The walls are stacked from the floor to literally the ceiling. You need a ladder to get to the top. Yeah, so here we have wines from Lebanon, from Israel, from Mexico and Canada, U.S., Australia, Argentina, Chile, and uh, South Africa. Did I say New Zealand? There are bottles from France, from Spain, Portugal, Italy. It looks like a wine library in here. And they always listen to good music, the wines. (laughs) And they're just staring and saying, pick me, pick me. And when you walk in... The Armenian wines are right in front of you. It used to be just this shelf here, and now it's all of this to here. Then we have wines of France. You see how compacted they are now because all the Armenian wines are taking over? There are so many Armenian wines now that they're crowding out the fancy French ones. It shows how much has changed since Invino opened in 2012. When Invino first opened, we had only had 10 drinkable Armenian wines. And when I say drinkable, I literally mean we're like, hmm, okay, this is good. This is good. That was hardly an industry. But people had started to invest in Armenian wine. During Soviet times, Georgia was the country assigned to make wine, while Armenian grapes were used for brandy. Wine fell out of focus. Then, in 2011, a team of archaeologists published a paper about the discovery of the oldest winery in the world. It was 6,000 years old, and it was right here in Armenia, in this cave by the village of Arani. This helped kickstart the industry. It got people to remember that Armenians have been making wine for a long, long time. And because it's been part of Armenia since prehistory, it was easy to start up again. With other cultures who don't drink wine, who are mainly beer drinking, it wouldn't have happened this fast, I think. This rebirth. 
This balance between the old and the new is so Armenian. Winemaking is both ancient and innovative. The same way Armenia has been around for thousands of years, but the country is just a few decades old. And wine is like this time machine. It lets you travel in between all these eras of Armenia's past. Mariam no longer says that there are just 10 drinkable wines. I tell people, like, I'm not ashamed right now of all the 250 we have today. Mariam was born in Yerevan, but while she was growing up, she spent 10 years in the U.S. In 2004, after her family returned here, they opened up this restaurant called The Club. It was one of the early fancy restaurants in the city. At the time, there were a few professional Armenian wines, but they were unhappy with the consistency. Because one bottle was amazing, the other bottle was corked, one bottle was vinegar, so no, no constant quality of wine. Really, like you'd like open up a bottle and like yeah, it would be like vinegar. Yeah, like just outright horrible wine. Her godfather arranged a meeting between him, his son, and Mariam, where he suggested that they open up a little place that specialized just in wine. We had no idea what we were getting into, honestly. They were the first wine bar in the country. If you walk into Invino now, it feels so lived in. But when she first saw the space, it was this dusty, abandoned room. It was just like an empty place full of tiles and white walls. Uh, I even remember when we first opened, the neighbors would come down and they'd be like, what is this place? You know, and when we told them it was wine, they're like, wow, this place has only been like for handbags and like a place for selling children's clothing. In Vino is on Sarian Street. I used to live right off Sarian Street back in 2009, and it was a quiet neighborhood. I would walk down the street a few times a day, and there was not much going on. No restaurants, barely any people. They were like, are you sure this is going to work? And we were just like, no, nobody is <laughs> sure. Of course we're not sure, but we want to try it because it has never been done before. Sarian was where you would go to get your old computer fixed. That Sarian street feels like it's from a different country. And in a way, it was a different country. Yerevan had fewer businesses, fewer events, fewer people out around the city. Armenia was in an earlier stage of figuring out who it would be as an independent country. But there were people like Mariam who were excited about the possibility here, who wanted to see where Armenia could go next. Sarian Street has transformed since Invino first opened. Most of those old computer shops and kids' clothing stores have been repurposed into chic restaurants and bars. Now, the street is synonymous with nightlife. But on Sarian, we're, we have new places open and go every day. Like, I'm looking at these places and I'm thinking, this is probably like an apartment or something, and all of a sudden it's like a little uh, cafe. This is like considered now the hipster street, I think. And I love that. In summer, it's bustling seven nights a week. Walk down Sarin on a Monday, and there will be people crowded at tables up and down the sidewalk for blocks. Wine has been part of Armenia's story since the beginning, and it can be a bridge from its ancient history to the Soviet era to today. But it can also take us back to an Armenia from just a few years ago, an Armenia that was so different. Each and every single one of these bottles has a story behind them. Unlike most drinks, there is this connection between wine and the land where it's from. The flavor comes from how people have worked the dirt and grown the grapes. When you sit down with a bottle, there's a moment to really connect with that story. People don't have that same experience with vodka or milk or juice. In winemaking, there's this word terroir. It means everything in the environment that went into making that bottle of wine. So the climate, the air, the weather, and every year it's different. That connection came sharply into focus in 2020. 
So now 2020 vintage wines are very, very specific because every time you open a 2020 vintage, what do you remember? What was going on in the world? There are some wineries that Armenians don't have anymore. When the war broke out in 2020, Mariam had a friend who had to evacuate from a winery in the Hatrut region of Artsakh. Hadrut is now under Azerbaijani control. Armenians can't go there anymore. And she just grabbed a few bottles of wine off the table when she was coming here from the winery. She came here unlabeled, unmarked wines. We had no idea what they were. And we were sitting here drinking this wine and all these emotions and we're talking to each other and just all of this, you know, you, you kind of need to somehow take it out of you talk to people. So I, it really does help. Um, everyone has a way of dealing with what they're dealing with. And I think e- to each person, there's like a different way. But wine is, is a medium. They were sitting around a table with a bottle that came from a specific place. Drinking it was a way to process it all. Losing the winery, losing the land, losing the war. Uncorking a bottle transports a bit of the past right there in front of you. It literally does. There's a liquid that's been preserved in there maybe for years, but it also figuratively brings back your memories. Think, what's on a wine label? The winemaker, the grape, and then right there, where it's from and the year. You look at that year and you go back to that time. It's a story. It's hard to drink a 2020 Armenian wine and not think about the war, about the land where Armenians have been making wine for thousands of years that is now empty of Armenians. Nairi picks up a bottle of Zulal wine. This is actually a 2016 reserve Sireni from Artsakh, so this is why it's so special. Very few left. There are hundreds of grape varieties that are from Armenia. The one used to make this wine, the Sireni grape, is indigenous to Artsakh. Nairi can't resist. She ends up buying it. Thank you. Thank you. We say goodbye to Mariam, step outside onto Sarian Street, and look at the bottle. It feels like something of this moment, of the years we've lived through here. I probably won't drink it. It makes sense to want to hold on to the bottle. It's a way to hold on to everything else. But that's not what wine is for. So a few months later, Gohar, Nairi, and I sit on the same balcony where we started this season. Should we open it? Yeah. Cheers. Cheers. It's like tart. It feels dark. Mm-hmm. It feels earthy. Since it's from 2016, it has lived through some history. Yeah, a lot has happened since this was bottled. Mm. But I feel like that's we're we're honoring it in a way by drinking it together. The story of Sarian Street shows how quickly things can change here. It shows the potential. After the revolution, the country was electric with possibility. When I came here in 2019, it was blossoming. I remember walking down Sarian Street during this festival called Wine Days. They closed it off to traffic for the weekend, so wineries and restaurants could set up dozens of stands. People were out wandering up and down the blocks, drinking glass after glass of Armenian wine. They were in the streets, and they were smiling. I had never seen anything like it here before. It was so far away from the quieter, more stoic Armenia that I first came to a decade before. But 2019 also feels far away 
from the Armenia of 2023. An Armenia that has 120,000 people blockaded in Artsakh. An Armenia that's living with a constant creeping threat of war. And 2023 Armenia is one that's also filled with whole new groups of people who've been arriving since the war in Ukraine. During our talk, Mariam repeatedly brought up how she felt that the growing wine industry is helping Armenia grow, despite all the uncertainty. We're not scared that something's going to happen. We're continuing to work because through that, you can show your support for your country, for this piece of land that we call ours. It's one of the themes that kept coming up all season. Again and again, the people we talked with brought up how the people of Armenia rise and fall together. It wasn't a question we were asking, and not everyone said it, but we kept hearing it. Kolya referred to Armenians as his family. That's, that's, I think, is responsibility of everyone in the family, to try and make each other a little bit better. Mane talked about it. This is what I love. This is my people. I love my people. I love my country. I love the streets. I mean, these people have already become a member of your family, the big family. And Ruben said it. We are all part of the same chain. Every link, we, each one of us is a link in that chain. We're all connected. And chain, you know, sinks all together. If you throw a chain in the water, no links will be left floating on the surface. It's going to sink all together. The past few years have been turbulent, often divisive. But for better or for worse, Armenians have been living through all this together. Gohar, Nairi, and I, we each have thought about this a lot, about where Armenia is now, how to process it all, and what comes next. I've lived through a lot of changes. The Soviet Union breaking up, Armenia struggling through independence, political regimes getting more repressive, hopes rising and being crushed. But the most recent changes feel different. Living through the 2020 Arsakh war has changed how I see Armenia. For 30 years, I took for granted the fact that I have a country, a place I can call home. Now, it doesn't feel like I'm standing on solid ground anymore. But this is how things are now, and we're living through it. Gohar is right. Things do feel different lately. The stakes feel higher. This moment feels existential. But it's not the first time Armenians have felt this way. In our first episode, I read The Country of Dust, Vahan Tekeyan's poem that our podcast is named after. He wrote it in the aftermath of the Armenian genocide, but it feels like it's meant for us now. He writes... How can you dream of old architecture today, when every edifice caves in to make way for new shapes? Meaning, how can you live through change, through loss? How can you honor the past, but also find your place in the newness? When every edifice caves in to make way for new shapes, how do you act instead of just watching it all crumble and turn into something else? And then, Tekeon gives us an answer. Husa, tizve, poshin log aitbes bidi noren karalla. Accumulate. Dust consolidates into stone. Thanks for listening to this season. Country of Dust is created and produced by Nairi Abrahamian, Jeremy Dalmas, and Gohar Khachatrian, 
with help from Gabrielle Caprielian. Sound engineering and music by Jeremy Dalmas. Graphic design by Nune Hudaverdian. Thanks to Arig for holding down the fort. Thanks to Chris Natalie for taking some amazing photos. And thanks to Monty. You can follow us on Instagram and Facebook for updates and details on our stories. Our handle is the same as our name, Country of Dust. Thanks for the support from the Creative Armenia AGBU Fellowship, Impact Hub Yerevan, the Fahe and Lucy Foundation, and the Nexus Center for the Arts. And again, thank you, thank you, thank you for listening. This podcast is for you. And we hope that it helped you understand Armenia better. Whether you're from here or if you just learned how to say Shnora Kalutsun. See you soon!